A very good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. This is the lecture five of the CSA Level 3 umpiring course hosted by Western Province Cricket Umpires Association. My name is Abdullah Steenkamp. I am flying solo today. What I'll be covering in today's lecture is I'll do a few of the dismissal laws and then I will also cover Law 41, which deals with fair and unfair play. Then we'll do some revision questions and then we, I will open the floor for our usual Q&A. So to kick off today's um, laws, I'm starting with the court law. Let's look at video first. Fair catch. A catch shall be considered fair if the ball is held in a fielder's hand, hugged to the body of the catcher, or accidentally lodges in his or her clothing, helmet, or protective equipment. But of course, this being cricket, it isn't always that simple. If a fielder deliberately uses an item of clothing to try to catch the ball, it is not out and five penalty runs are awarded to the batting side. However, the ball can be caught after it has deflected off the other batsman, an umpire, another fielder, including off a helmet being worn, or even if it lodges in a fielder's helmet. Perhaps the main criterion for a catch to be considered fair is that the ball must not touch the ground before being caught. Here, for example, the ball does not touch the ground even though the hand holding it does so in affecting the catch. This is a fair catch. And then there is the question of catches near the boundary. This is such an interesting subject that we've given it a film all of its own. To catch up on everything to do with catching, simply refer to Law 33 in the Blue Book. There are a few points that I want to emphasize that was covered in the video. Uh, firstly, no runs to be scored if a striker gets, gets dismissed uh, caught. Uh, secondly, uh, we saw if a ball deflects off a fielder's helmet and the ball then gets taken by a fielder before uh, touching the ground, that is also deemed a fair catch. And lastly, court to take precedence over any other dismissal except bold. So if there's more than one dismissal and one of them is not bold and, and court is one of them, and let's say of a single ball, the um, of batter gets caught and one of the batters gets run out, court to take precedence in this particular scenario. Next law I'm covering is obstructing the field. Let's look at a video first. Obstructing the field. A batsman is out obstructing the field if he or she willfully attempts to obstruct or distract the fielding side by word or action. Like this, for example. Thank you, Tommy. In particular, it is considered to be obstruction if, while the ball is in play and after the striker has played the ball, either batsman willfully strikes the ball with a hand not holding the bat or any other part of his or her person or with the bat. The exception to this is when the batsman is attempting to defend his or her wicket. The batsman may do this with the bat or any part of his or her person, except with a hand not holding the bat. If the batsman uses such a hand, he or she will be out obstructing the field. The handled the ball law no longer exists, with such incidents now covered by obstructing the field instead. The obstruction has to be 
willful. Accidental obstruction, or obstruction caused by trying to avoid injury, does not count, and the decision on that is down to the umpire. It's worth noting that if a catch is obstructed, it is the striker who is out, even if it was the non-striker who caused the obstruction. Mind you, it's not always an easy decision. Here, the batsman deliberately crosses out of the legal running area in order to attempt to obstruct a throw. There is no other reason why the batsman should be running across the pitch. What looked an accident was, in fact, an illegal incident. To avoid any possible confusion, read Law 37 in black and white in the blue book. There are a few things again that I want to highlight from uh, the video. Uh, firstly, so if either batter is dismissed obstructing the field, unless the obstruction, obstruction prevents a catch from being made, runs completed by the batters before the offence uh, shall be scored, together with any uh, award for penalties like a no ball or white. Secondly, if the obstruction prevents a catch from being taken, no runs to be scored. Again, if the obstruction prevents a catch from being taken, no runs to be scored. And another thing I want to highlight, when it comes to if obstruction uh, that prevents a catch from being uh, taken, the striker will be given out. Even though the non-striker caused the obstruction, but if the obstruction prevents a catch from being taken, always the, stri the striker to be given out, even if the non-striker caused the obstruction. Under the run-out law, let's quickly see what the law say about the run-out. It tells us that while the ball is still in play, and either batter is out of his or her ground, and the wicket is fairly put down by the action of a fielder, including if the ball made contact with a helmet worn by the by a fielder or even uh, the keeper, and also even though a no ball has been called, a batter can still be out run out. And then lastly, under the run-out law, it's irrelevant whether a batter attempted a run or not. If either of the batters is out of his or her ground and the wicket is fairly put down by the action of a fielder, that batter will be out run out. Again, I want to emphasize it's not relevant whether a run is taken or not. Lots of players think a run must be attempted for a run-out to be affected. N not the case. You can here see the, what the run-out law say. All it needs to happen is ball needs to be uh, in play, either better out of his or her ground, and then the wicket being fairly put down by any of the fielders, even if it made contact uh, with a helmet worn by the fielder or the helmet worn by the wicket keeper. So if it goes against the helmet, ricochets from the helmet that was worn, let's say, by the short leg fielder and ricochets back onto the stumps and the batter out of his or her ground, that is also deemed run out. So now we've covered when you will be run out. There are times when the batter will not be out run out. So what are those times? Firstly, the batter was within his or her ground and then left it to avoid injury when the wicket was uh, put down. The important thing here is the batter must have first made his or her ground, so any part of the person or the bat was put behind the popping crease. Then the ball came in, let's say a throw came in from uh, fine leg, batter made his ground, but to avoid the throw, the batter then subsequently leaves it to get out of the way of the throw. The keeper then gathers the ball and take, uh, takes off the bails. In this in instance, 
the batter will not be outrun out because the batter was within his or her ground. The batter only left it to avoid injury, hence not out. Another instance where a batter is not outrun out, the ball was not touched by a fielder. It is important there needs to be an intervention by a member of the fielding side for a run out to be uh, uh, effected. Um, I'll use an example. Uh, for a striker hits the ball down the wicket. Uh, the ball then strikes the non-striker. Let's say strikes the non-striker's foot. Ricochets from the non-striker onto the stumps at the bowler's end with the non-striker half a meter outside the crease. I promise you, fielders will appeal because they don't know the law, but you as the umpire will say not out. And the reason for not out, a ball must touch a fielder first and then go onto the stumps for a run out to be affected. Another instance where a batter is also out a uh, not out uh, the run out is when a no ball gets bowled, striker misses the ball, wicketkeeper takes off the bells, striker not behind the popping crease when the wicket is fairly uh, put down. So because a no ball was bowled and the batter is not behind the stumps, yes, the the uh, the um, batter will not be out stumped. Why? Because you cannot be stumped off a no ball. But the law also gives you immunity not to be run out. Because technically, when the wicket was put down, you were not behind the popping crease when the wicket was put down by the keeper. But you get immunity in this case and only this case when a no ball gets bowled and the keeper takes off the bells and the keeper uh, and uh, the keeper takes off uh, the bells you cannot be outstumped you also get immunity from being a run out provided that you have not attempted a run also importantly if there was a subsequent intervention by any other fielder and then the wicket is put down then you are liable to be a run out if you are not behind the popping crease. An example of this, no ball gets bowled, a spinner bowls, no ball gets bowled, batter uh, steps out the crease, misses the ball, keeper then gathers the ball. Now we know a no ball was called, a batter cannot be outstumped. The ball then ricochets from the keeper's gloves to the short leg fielder. Fielder then picks up the ball, throws it at the stumps with a non-striker not behind the crease. In this case, because there was a, uh, an intervention from another fielder except the, the keeper, the batter will be out, run out. Last of the dismissals law that we're covering is stumped. Let's look at a video first. Stumped. All batsmen fear being stumped, and all wicketkeepers dream of stumping batsmen. So, let's be clear about the law. The only player who can stump a batsman is this fellow, the wicketkeeper. A stumping can take place provided that the ball is not a no ball. You can be stumped off a wide, however. Here, for example, the batsman has moved out of his or her ground to play the ball, but has missed it and has not attempted a run. The wicket is fairly put down by the wicketkeeper without the intervention of another fielder. When all these conditions are met, the batsman will find that he or she has indeed been stumped. It's also okay for the ball to rebound onto the stumps off any part of the wicketkeeper, including his or her protective equipment or helmet. If it is a no ball, the batsman will not be outstumped and is also protected from being run out as long as he or she is not attempting a run. 
don't be stumped about stumping. Get a copy of the Blue Book and study Law 39. Before we move on to fair and unfair play, lots of players when it comes to stumping think if the ball touched the protective helmet of the keeper, you cannot be outstumped. You saw in the video that if the ball ricochets off the helmet onto the stumps with the better sort of visual ground, better will be outstumped. Law 41 deals with fair and unfair play. And for this course, we will cover what the law say with regards to fair and unfair play. There are, for many competitions, there are various playing conditions, and sometimes the playing conditions are slightly different to uh, what the law say. But for the, but for the purposes of this course, we are covering the laws of cricket, and we will cover what the law say about fair and unfair play. We will kick off with what happens if there was a deliberate distraction or deception or obstruction of any of the batters after the ball was delivered. The umpires, so what do the umpires do? Firstly, there needs to be a willful attempt with the emphasis on willful. And that's a judgment call that, that uh, the umpires needs to make. Uh, good practice is to get together um, to discuss this and to confirm that the action of any member of the fielding side was a willful attempt. This willful attempt can be by either word or an action. And this word or action then distracted, obstructed, or deceived either of the batters after the striker has received the ball. So this is the conditions that needs to be in place for a deliberate distraction, deception, or obstruction. So when this happens, you call and signal dead ball. Neither better to be dismissed from this delivery. Five penalty runs to be awarded to the batting side. Ball not to count as one for the over. Any runs completed before the offence to be scored, including any runs for penalties, like if a no ball was bowled, that will also count. And additionally, the run in progress, whether the bat is crossed or not, shall also be scored. Then the batters at the wicket, they to decide who faces the next uh, delivery. And then lastly, you'll inform everyone and report the incident to the governing body. So you know you can now see there's a fairly um, harsh punishment for when any member of the fielding side deliberately, willfully attempted by either word or action to distract, obstruct, or deceive um, either better. Again, good practice. Call in signal dead ball, go to your colleague, discuss it, discuss what you've seen. If it was a willful attempt to deceive, distract, um, or obstruct, then you apply uh, these uh, points. Next section of unfair play. So what happens if a bowler bowls a dangerous and unfair non-pitching delivery, a uh, full toss? What happens? Law tell us that any delivery which passes or would have passed above, uh, without pitching, above the waist of the striker standing upright at the popping crease. So that is your the um, the point of judgment, your judgment point that you need to make. You need to make your call. The batter standing upright at the popping crease. That is where you need to judge whether it is above waist or not. 
we'll often find um, the striker uh, double stepping, trying to get to the the, the pitch uh, of the ball, and then uh, when contact was made, the striker Lisa, let's say two meters outside uh, the the crease. You do not make your judgment call. Uh, at the impact point, at this two meters outside the crease, you need to judge if that striker would have would have been standing upright at the popping crease, would it have been above or waist height or not? That is your judgment point, upright at the popping crease. And if your answer to that question is yes, if the striker was standing upright at the popping crease and the ball would have been uh, above or waist height, Either on par to call and signal no ball. It is uh, the the striker in on par is in the best position to make that call because the striker in on par as a as a um, side on view. It's nothing debarring the bowlers in on par from calling it. Because sometimes you can find strikers in on par being uh, a blinded uh, background maybe or, or setting sun. So either umpire to call it, but strikers in umpire is in the best position to call this. So strikers in umpire to call and signal no ball if it is above waist height of the striker standing upright at the popping crease. And according to the law, this is deemed dangerous and uh, unfair, and it's irrelevant whether it was going to inflict physical injury of the striker or not. Law tell us it's irrelevant. If it's above waist height, wherever the ball is, you need to call and signal no ball if it is above waist height of the striker standing upright at the popping crease. Then what do you then do? Bowler in a then to caution the bowler, indicating that this is a first and final warning for bowling a full toss above waist height to the uh, striker. Bowlers in umpire then also to inform the other umpire, also inform the captain of the fielding side and the batters of what just happened. And this first and final warning to apply throughout this particular innings. So if it happens in the first innings, throughout the first innings, this fine first and final will apply. So what happens? If you if in the same innings you bowl a second, or the same bowler bowls a second uh, ball above waist height of the striker standing upright at the pop increase, law now tell us you'll again call and signal no ball. When the ball is dead, you will direct the captain of the fielding side to immediately suspend the bowler from bowling. This bowler will now not be allowed to bowl again in this particular innings. And if it's the first innings, will not be allowed to bowl again in the first innings. Uh, if the first innings is at the end and, um, and uh, in the second innings, this particular bowler will then be allowed to bowl. Bowler will then start a uh, clean slate again. If applicable, and if, if this happens mid-over, the over needs to be completed by another bowler. And that bowler should not have bowled the previous over, nor is that bowler allowed to bowl the next over. And you also inform everyone and report this incident to the governing body. So just to summarize, when it comes to bowling a full toss above waist height of the striker standing upright at the pop increase, the first instance, call and signal no ball, You'll give the, the bowler first and final warning for bowling a, a, a ball above waist height. You'll inform everyone of what happened. If it happens again in that same innings, you'll again call and signal no ball. But now you'll tell the, uh, the fielding captain to remove or suspend the bowler uh, from the attack. And that bowler is not allowed to bowl again in that particular innings. And then over needs to be completed by another bowler who's not allowed, um, who did not bowl the previous uh, over, nor is he allowed to bowl the next over. And then lastly, you need to inform everyone and report this. Next one is bowling of a deliberate front foot no ball. 
So you might ask, what is a deliberate front foot, a no ball? This is a judgment call. Usually, the bowler needs to to uh, to bowl, uh, put his front foot quite far past the popping crease. But usually, something needs to happen for this bowler to want to bowl a deliberate front foot no ball. And it's you, and it's usually the case where there is a bit of friction between bowler and the striker. They would, there's probably words between the two of them, and then the bowler now wants to, let's say it's a fast bowler, there's a bit of words between the two, uh, bowler and striker, he now wants to try to hurt the striker, and then deliberately bowls a front foot noble. He puts his, his front foot quite far over the popping crease. To my, and the reason for that is, to um, get a bit more closer to the bowler, to bowl uh, more quicker. Let's say he wanted to bowl a bouncer, want to put his foot closer to the batter, and then will um, will then try maybe to injure the batter. So usually for this, uh, for when a deliberate front foot noble is to be bowled, this firstly there's a bit of RG, a bit of words between the the batter and the bowler, and the bowler. When putting down the front foot for that particular delivery, it is quite far over. You're probably looking at um, two feet, two and a half feet, three feet over the popping crease. But 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 your clues are uh, better words between batter and bowler, and then the front foot. Um, after those words, sometimes the very next delivery being quite far over the popping crease. Again, it's a judgment call. So if you consider after taking into account the uh, um, the words that was uh, that was um, went on between the bowler and the batter, if you consider that was this, this was a deliberate front foot no ball, what do you do? You'll call and signal no ball immediately. When the ball is dead, you will tell the captain of the fielding side to suspend this bowler immediately from bowling. You'll inform the other umpire what just happened and why you're doing what you're doing. This bowler not to be allowed to bowl again in this particular innings. If it happened mid-over, the over then needs to be completed by another bowler who has not bowled the previous over, nor is that bowler allowed to bowl the next over. You'll then inform the batters, you'll inf uh, when possible, inform the captain of the batting side, and then you to report this incident to the governing body of, of cricket for that particular competition. So quite a harsh punishment uh, for bowler bowling a deliberate front foot no ball. But again, before making this call, it is a judgment call. There are usually factors that you need to take into account. And two, the two factors that you take into account is there's usually better words between the batter and the bowler. And after that, the bowler now goes way past the, the pop increase when putting down his or her front foot when delivering the ball. You're probably looking at more, two feet or more, two and a half feet, three feet uh, over the pop increase. The protected area. So what is this protected um, uh, area? And I'll, and I'll show you with the use of uh, visuals. So this is the protected area. It is 1.52 meters from the popping crease and 3.48 uh, centimeters from the middle stump. And as it says, it's the protected area. You, the umpire, needs to make sure that you protect this area from bowlers and from the batters. So there, the, in red, that is the protected area, and you, the umpires, uh, it's a huge part of your job that you need to make sure that uh, the bowler, members of the fielding side, the batters, are not going into that area without reasonable cause. Let's look at a video. Damaging the pitch. 
Deliberately damaging the pitch is illegal and can be costly to the guilty player's side. A bowler will be deemed to be causing deliberate damage if the umpire considers that his or her presence on the protected area of the pitch, shown here in red, is without reasonable cause. This can be after delivering the ball, or if the bowler fails to release the ball after the completion of the delivery swing and delivery stride. The first offence will receive a caution. The second, a final warning. And if the bowler does it again, he or she will be suspended from bowling for the rest of the innings and may well face disciplinary action after the match. For fielders and batsmen, it is the whole pitch that they must not damage, not just the protected area. If any fielder causes deliberate damage to the pitch, he or she will face a similar caution and be reported to the captain. If there is a repeat offence by any fielder during that innings, five runs are awarded to the batting side. Finally, if either batsman causes deliberate damage to the pitch, the batsman will be given a first and final warning and told this practice is unfair. This warning will apply through the innings and each incoming batsman will be warned. Should this happen again, the umpire will disallow all runs from that delivery, other than the penalty for a no ball or wide. Furthermore, the umpire will award five penalty runs to the fielding side, return the batsmen to their original ends, inform both captains, and the offending player may well face disciplinary action after the match. If you're in any doubt, refer to Law 41 in the Blue Book. So let's look at uh, two aspects of uh, the protected area. We'll firstly cover what do we do when the bowler runs in the protected area? And secondly, what happens if the batters, uh, without a reasonable cause, runs on the pitch? Let's start with the bowler. Law tell us it's unfair for a bowler to enter the protected area in his or her follow through without reasonable cause whether or not the ball is delivered. Bowlers, after delivering the ball, needs to get off the pitch. They need to stay out of the protected area. Unless there is a cause, like say the batter hits the ball straight down the pitch and the bowler wants to feel the ball, then there's a reason why the bowler needs to go into the protected area. You'll allow that. Uh, if the uh, Bowler delivers the ball, the batter then hits the ball in the air above the protected area for the catch to be taken. The bowler then uh, is allowed to go in there because there's now a reason why the bowler uh, to go in the protected area. So if there is a reasonable cause, no issue. But otherwise, bowler not allowed in the protected area, you, uh, uh, they need to get off the pitch immediately after delivering the ball. So what happens if the bowler goes into the protected area after delivering uh, the ball? So what law tell us is that you'll caution the bowler and inform the other umpire of what has happened. And this caution for running in the protected area shall apply throughout the innings. You'll inform the captain of the fielding side and the batters of what just occurred. So then, in that same innings, the same bowler, and it doesn't matter which side, but as long as it's in the same innings, again runs in, in, into the protected area. So what do you now do? You'll now give the bowler a final warning for running in the protected area. And this final warning again to apply throughout this particular innings. And then in the same innings, this same bowler now goes in the protected area after delivering a ball 
without reasonable cause for a third time. So what you then do, now you need to ask the captain of the fielding side to suspend the bowler. And if need be, if this happened mid-over, over to be completed by another bowler who didn't bowl the previous over, nor is that bowler allowed to bowl the next over. You'll then inform everyone and report this to the governing body. So just to summarize, so what the law say, bowler not to go into the protected area without reasonable cause. Okay. If the bowler goes in there without the reasonable cause, first time you give the bowler a caution, that caution to apply throughout the innings. You'll inform the bowler, tell your colleague that you've just given the bowler a warning, also inform the fielding captain that you've given the bowler a caution. Now it happens again. Doesn't matter which in, because sometimes bowlers will switch in, bowl from the other side if they're in, you then give the bowler his, uh, his or a final warning for running into the protected area without a reasonable cause. You'll then inform the bowler, your colleague, and inform the fielding captain. And if it happens a third time in that innings that the bowler is in the protected area without a reasonable cause, you will then ask the fielding captain to suspend the bowler immediately and the over will be completed by another bowler if uh, need be. So this is what the law say. How to handle. First in, caution. Second time, a final. Third time, the suspend. Uh, but practically, so how um, we how we usually deal uh, with this, and also it depends on the, the, the state of the game, but usually, if a bowler, let's say it's the first over of the game, and the bowler in his, uh, in his or her follow through, goes into the protected area. So what I'll usually do is, I'll have a quiet word with the bowler, I'll work with the bowler. As the bowler walks past me, I'll whisper in the bowler's ear, bowler, um, in your follow through, you actually went into, into the protected area. Try to work with the bowler. Again, this is just practically how I deal with this. There's nothing in the law that says you need to have a word with the bowler. The law says if the bowler's in, you give a caution, second time, one final warning, third time, you remove. But you try to work with the uh, with the, the bowler. So bowler goes in there, first over, goes in the first time, I'll have a word. So bowler, I'll whisper in his ear, you in, please, you need to get um, off um, out of the protected area. Then let's say in, um, two overs later, bowler goes in there again. Now I'll, I'll have a bit of more sterner word. I'll tell the bowler, bowler, it's now second time I'm speaking to you. I need you to stay out of the protected uh, area. I'll also mention it to the bowler's captain that I've spoke to the bowler again, and I'll mention it to my colleague as well. So now, again, uh, let's say over later, bowler now goes in there. Now, um, after speaking to the bowler on two occasions, I will now go over to action by telling the bowler, bowler, I've spoken to you now two times. You're, still, you're staying in the protected area. I'm now giving you a caution for running in the protected area. I'll then inform my colleague and my captain. Again, this is just my, my way. I initially, I try to work with, uh, with the bowler. There's nothing in the law. The law just say, if he's in, you caution. Second time, final warning, third time you take out of the attack. But I try to work with the bowler, especially early in the game, first over. If the bowler's in, I try to work. I usually use, um, if I can use f the word friendly warnings, I'll, I'll speak to the bowler the first time. Second time, I'll speak to the bowler uh, and he's a captain. And then the third time, I'll go. But, the, but again, this is just my method. I try to work with the bowler, especially if it's early on. Uh, if the game situation is different, because sometimes the bowlers will try to roughen up that protected area to bring their spinners in the game. So let's say it's the third innings of um, of the game, uh, or, or, there's the, or there's, they're close to a declaration and they maybe try want to roughen up the protected area to get the spinners in play. You need to also be your match awareness um, um, needs to be good because you need to know that the bowlers might try to 
to roughen up the protected area. In that case, I'll be a bit more stern. I'll I will I will um, speak to the bowler. I won't go uh, too friendly, and then I'll go. If the match situation allows allows it, I'll start the first time. I'll get in there and I'll say, bowler, you're in. You need to stay off. Um, and then the second time I'll go. The point I'm just trying to make it make is depending on the match situation, I do try to work with the bowlers, but there are times where you do need to be stern and apply the, these things immediately. But, but there are times where you, you you can try to work with the with the bowler. Also, a, a trick. Um, I, I hear a bit of background noise. Can you please mute your microphone? Thank you so much. The um, also a trick that the bowlers do is they'll bowl your side, and now you've uh, now you spoke to the bowler once, you spoke to him a second time, and now what they'll do is they'll now go bowl from the other side. So that's why it's important that you do inform your colleague of the. Um, your colleague of the, the friendlies or even the cautions that you did give the bowler that your colleague is informed because bowlers love doing it. They love switching in, thinking they're now both from the other side. Maybe they're going to get uh, away with it. You need to work together as, as a team. So if a bowler from your side bowled, bowled um, um, can you please mute your microphone? I hear a bit of background noise. The okay, just give me a second. I'm just going into. I'm just going to mute. I'm not sure whose mic is on, but I'm going to mute it. Okay, they have muted. I'll just go back to my screen. So, so usually. Uh, a bowler will try, will switch ends, will try to bowl from the other side. So what you do is, you, um, if the if your partner already spoke to the bowler from your side, or if your partner's already given the bowler a, a caution, when that bowler comes your side, you speak to that bowler. You tell the bowler, bowler, my colleague's already given you a caution from um, from his side. So I'm just letting you know that if you're gonna go in there now. I'm going to go straight to action because we've already tried to work with you. We've already spoke to you. Um, but just I'm mentioning this because this is a, uh, a trick that the bowlers love doing. Bowling, uh, going to bowl from the other side if if the, if, um, the other colleagues already spoken to him about running in. We've now dealt with bowlers running into protected area. So what do we do if batters damage the pitch? Law tell us that it is unfair for the batters to cause deliberate or avoidable damage to the pits. The striker enters the protected area in playing or playing at the ball. The striker needs to move out of the protected area immediately thereafter. So yes, you'll allow the striker to let's say a spinner bowls and the striker double steps to get to the pitch of the ball, you uh, the law allows for that. But as soon as the striker has played that ball, the striker needs to get out of the protected area, get off the pitch when when running. So what happens if either batters causes deliberate damage to the pitch? Umpire seeing this, so I'll wait till the ball is dead and inform the other of umpire of what just happened. Bowlers in umpire then to own both batters and saying that this is what you're doing is unfair and I'm giving you a first and final warning. This first and final warning to apply throughout the innings. And this is a team warning. So each and every new batter that comes to the wicket, you need to inform that batter as well that your team is on a first and final warning 
for damaging the pits. You'll inform the fielding captain that you've given the batters uh, uh, first and final warning and captain of the batting side when practicable. So what happens if in that same innings there is an, a further instance of the batters causing avoidable damage to the pits? What do you then do? You've now given them a first and final warning. Now again, they run straight down the middle. They're on the pitch without reasonable uh, cause. So what do you do? The bowlers in umpire then, you to disallow all runs to the batting side. Return any not out batter to his or her original in. If there was a wide or noble, you'll signal that to the scorers. Five penalty runs to the fielding side. You will also award any other five penalty runs except protective helmets belonging to the fielding side. You will inform everyone and report this to the governing body of cricket. You can see there's a fairly uh, um, harsh punishment for batters damaging the pitch or causing avoidable uh, 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 damage to the pitch. So firstly, you will you'll, um, give a first and final and then secondly, if they do it again, you'll disallow runs, award five penalty runs, um, you'll inform everyone and report to the governing body. You'll apply these five uh, bullet points. So again, similarly to, this is what the law say, but similarly to, to the bowlers, initially I try to work uh, with, the, with the bowlers, uh, depending on the match situation, but I'll come back to the second one. So, so let's say in the first, in, uh, the first over of the game, I see the batters running in the uh, straight down the middle of, of the pitch, one of the batter running down. I will have firstly have a quiet word with the batter saying, batter, I notice you're running straight down the middle of the pitch. You need to get off the pitch when running. So I'll have a word with the with the batter. I'll work with the batter first, oh, first over of the game. I'll work with the batter. If I, if I see it again, I now have a more sterner word. I'll say, better, but I spoke to you earlier uh, about getting off. You did it again. So if I see it again, I will then go into action. But I'll inform both batters because um, it's not just a particular pattern. This causing avoidable damage to the pits applies to both batters. So it's not just, uh, uh, let's say, batter A and um, I only speak to batter A, but batter B can still run down. No, the, uh, when you have a word, have a word with both bat batters because it applies to both of them. So after firstly speaking to first over, it happens, spoke to the batter. Sick, then in the third over, happens again, I'll have a more sterner word. And then if it happens again, I'll now tell the batter, better, but I spoke to you on two occasions. Um, I now need to go into action. Sometimes the match situation uh, wants you to be even more sterner. So you'll often find the in the third innings, uh, side A is busy batting. Uh, it's the uh, morning of the, the fifth day. It's a wearing pitch. They've got three spinners in their side. So what the batters will try to do, they'll try to roughen up the protected area to bring their spinners in the game. So you need to, your match awareness needs to be spot on. So you need to watch the batsman carefully, especially in the third innings, especially if they've got spinners on a wearing pitch. They will try to roughen up that area and you need to be vigilant. You need to watch them uh, like a hawk. And, in, and because the match situation in this example uh, um, wants me to be now a bit more, uh, more stern, because now I, I won't have first speak and then secondly and only third. I will now, if I see it, I'll immediately, I'll go, I say better. I saw you running straight down. I need you to stay off the pit. If I see you again, I'm going to go and uh, go to a first and final warning. So again, if it happens the first, uh, first over of the game, um, I'll be a bit more lenient. I'll work with a better. But if the match situation wants me to be more vigilant, wants me to be stern, you need to then take a much quicker action uh, than at other times. Again, that is just uh, my man management style. I do try to work with the bowlers and the batters, also taking the match situation into account. Uh, 
you'll see you, you saw now in the law nothing in the law that say, uh, say uh, that says have first uh, acquired worth with the bowlers or the batters there's nothing in there um it just says if it's in you can go to action but i do try to manage the situation initially and after trying to manage it if they continue i then go into into action So that is all the laws that I'm covering for today. I'm now going to go into the revision questions. And as usual, our revision questions are interactive. So what I'll do is I am going to uh, allow your cameras to be switched on. So just give me uh, a second while I switch on those that do want to put on the uh, cameras can put on the cameras if they want to just give me just give me a second so um, i'm going to read the questions you then um, you can raise your hand and then unmute yourself put on your camera and then um, give me the answer just give me a second just unmute Okay, I'm going to switch on my camera. I'm now I'm going to activate all of your cameras as well. Okay, your camera is also activated. And I'll see my screen again. And we will now go through the revision question. OK, the first revision question for today. And again, you can see it's a, it's a lengthy question, but, but the best way to, to answer this question is try to visualize uh, what they're telling us, because if you visualize it, it's much easier than to answer the question. So left arm spinner, bowls a delivery towards the striker. Striker hits the ball against the helmet worn by the silly point fielder. The ball ricochets in the air towards the cover fielder who catches the ball. So before the ball touches the ground, the cover fielder catches the ball. So ricochets from silly point's helmet straight to cover fielder who catches it before the ball touches the ground. So after catching it, the fielder, the cover fielder then sees the other batter, the informed batter who's at the non-striker's end, sort of a uh, ground, and then throws the ball at the bowler's end with the non-striker sort of a uh, ground. Explain your actions for three points. The first hand that I'm seeing is Ahmed. Ahmed, if you can unmute your microphone and let me know the answer for the scenario, please, Ahmed. Uh, good morning, Abdullah. Morning to you, Ahmed. Um, the ball ricocheted off the silly point fielder mm -hmm. of the helmet, so that's allowed. The yeah. ball has not been. Um, it has not touched the ground and uh, mm -hmm. the cover fielder has taken the catch. So mm -hmm. court precedes any other dismissal besides bowl. Mm -hmm. So even though we attempted the run out, the, the non-striker is still not out and the striker would be out. Well done, Ahmed. Perfect answer. So in this, the striker is out court, the ball delivered by the bowler, touches uh, is a bad without having precision contact with the field and, and it's subsequently held uh, by a fielder before it touches the ground. Strikers not out bold, then he uh, or she will be out caught, even though a decision against either batter for another method of dismissal would be justified. So in this scenario, the striker is out caught as the ball as the ball can strike a fielder's helmet and still be caught. So upon taking the catch, 
the ball then actually becomes dead immediately. The runout can be ignored. And as you also said, Ahmed, court takes precedence if there's more than one dismissal of uh, of the same ball. And if one of those dismissals is not bold, court will take precedence over any other uh, dismissal. Yeah, so well done, Ahmed. Next of the revision questions. Final ball, last over of the day. Striker gets an inside edge. The ball then ricochets from the keeper's gloves onto the keeper's helmet, onto the visor of the keeper's helmet. And from the visor of the helmet, then goes back onto the wickets, removing the belts with the striker sort of his or her ground. There's a huge appeal. What happens next? Oh, oh, what is your answer to the appeal? And, and give me reasons. So from the glove, it ricochets onto the keeper's visor, and from the visor goes onto the onto the wickets, removing the belts. Striker sort of is a ground. I don't see any new hands. Ahmed, I see your hand up again, but I'm looking for a new uh, hand. I don't see any new hands. I'll give them a few more seconds, uh, Ahmed. If if not, if I don't see a new hand, yeah, I do see a new hand. Uh, Jaya. Jaya, can you unmute your microphone and provide me with the answer, please? Yes. Uh, good morning, Abdullah. Uh, good morning to you. Yeah, the answer would be uh, that should be given stemmed out. The uh, appeal should be answered as an out mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the uh, the, bo uh, the ball can ricochet off the keeper's gloves and it can hit the helmet. If the battery is out of the ground, it can be given out. Well done, Zaya. That's 100% correct. Law tell us that the wicket is put down by the ball. It shall be regarded as having put down by the wicket keeper if the ball rebounds onto the stumps from any part of the keeper's person or equipment. So in this case, yes, it ricochets from the helmet um, onto the stumps. You can now see that the law allows for that. So that's why in this case, the batter to be given out stumped. Well done. Next question. Striker who is batting outside the crease to a spinner edges the ball and is caught by the first slip, first slip fielder off the keeper's grill. The bowler's in umpire calls a no ball for a front foot. The wicket keeper, seeing that the striker was not attempting a run, is still out of his or her ground and breaks the wicket after getting the ball back from first slip. There's an appeal. What is your answer? Out or not out and why? So, spin, batter edges the ball, it ricochets from the keeper's grill straight to first slip. First slip then sees striker not um, um, behind the popping crease, throws the ball back to the keeper, who in then in turns take off the bales. Out or not out, and why? I'm looking at any hands raised. I see Johan Berg. Johan, can, if you can unmute your microphone and provide me with the answer, please, Johan. The, an um, the answer to the question will be not out because the batter has not attempted a run and um, it's a no ball as well. Uh, yes, uh, Johan, you cannot be uh, you cannot be stumped of uh, a noble. Agree, uh, hundred percent uh, with you. But there is one particular uh, part of the law that you are that you that you that you missing. Um, I'm going to ask um, another hand that I see, Kunal. Can you add 
to what you want to say. Yes. You want to say, yes, you cannot be stumped of a noble. We agreed. I agree with that. Can you add something to your answer, please, Kuno? Yes, Abdullah. Uh, so uh, the batsman is run out, out uh, because uh, the fielder has intervened. And even though it's a no ball, and the batsman can be out, run out on a no ball, so the fielder has intervened and then uh, given the ball back to the wicket keeper to yeah. dislodge the wickets. Yeah. And hence, the batsman is out of his ground and therefore he is out, run out. Uh, yes, 100% uh, correct, Kunal. Uh, Johan? Um, yes, you were uh, correct in saying batter cannot be outstumped uh, of a noble. But the important part here is because of there was an intervention by another fielder. Someone else touched the ball. First slip touched the ball here. And first slip then threw the ball back to the keeper who then took off the bells with the batter not behind the popping crease. And because of this intervention by another fielder and the batter not being behind the popping crease, this batter or the striker will be out, a uh, run out. If there was no intervention by another fielder, then this batter would not have been out because a no ball was called, you cannot be outstumped, a run was not attempted, so now you get immunity from being uh, run out, only in that case. But because of the intervention by another fielder, i.e. in this case, the first slip, that's why this batter is out run out. Uh, thank you so much, Johan and Kunal. Let's just go through the answer. So, uh, Lord tell us that a batter is out run out. So while the ball is in play, the wicket is fairly put down by action of a fielder, even if a no ball was called, and whether a run was attempted or not. So that is the run out law. We also know that the striker is not run out if a no ball has been called and he or she is fairly uh, out of his or ground, not attempting a run, and the wicket is is put down by the wicket keeper without the intervention of a field of another fielder. But in this scenario, there was an intervention by the first slip fielder before the keeper broke the wicket with the striker out of his or ground. And that's why the striker in this scenario, because of the intervention by uh, uh, another fielder, uh, will be out, run out. So well done, Johan and Kunal. Next question. Again, try to visualize uh, what's happening. Striker hits a ball to the leg side, five meters in front of square. Calls, then calls the non-striker for a quick single. They completed one run. As they turn for the second run, the short leg fielder that, uh, was, uh, that was under the helmet now moves to his left and the short leg fielder stuck out his foot which now in turn trip the striker, who now falls to the ground. While the striker is lying on the ground, after being tripped by the short leg fielder, the mid-wicket fielder picks up the ball, throws it at the wicket keeper in, uh, at the keeper's in, and the striker is sort of his ground. This is a huge appeal. What is your answer to the appeal? And why? I see um, Amit and Jaya's hands are raised, but I'm looking for new hands. If I don't see new hands, I'll go, I'll go to you guys. But I first want to see if I can get new hands to answer uh, this question. Um, I'll give them a few, a few more seconds while they visualize the scenario, and then. Okay, I do see a new hand. Werner, if you can unmute yourself and let me know what happens here. So there's a huge appeal, Werner. Out or not out? 
Um, morning, Abdullah. Morning, everyone. Morning. Um, yes, there's quite a bit to this one. Um, yeah. Firstly, you'll call and signal dead ball. Yes. Then you'll ask the ball from the fielding side, and then mm -hmm. you'll go and consult with your colleague. Mm -hmm. um, then with your colleague, you will discuss whether this was a willful attempt to obstruct the batters. And obviously, this was as the fielder tried to obstruct them. Mm -hmm. Then neither batter will be dismissed from the delivery. Mm -hmm. So your answer will be it won't be out for run, it will be not out for the run out appeal. And then you as the bowlers and end umpires shall award five penalty runs to the batting side. Um, you will inform the captain of the fielding side for the reason for your decision. Then you will also um, you see the ball will not count as one for the over. Any runs completed by the batters before the offence shall be scored, together with any any other penalty runs awarded to uh, either side. Additionally, the run in progress shall also be scored. Um, and the batters at the wicket shall decide who of them will face the next delivery. And then you'll report the incident to the governing body. So all in all, the total runs to be scored it will be the five penalty runs, the one run that was completed, and the one run that was in progress. Yeah, so seven runs in total will be scored. I think that's it. Well done, Werner. That is a, yeah, that is a textbook answer. Let's go through the answer. So you call and signal dead ball. Again, ask the ball from the fielding side, and you'll walk towards your colleague. You'll ask the question, was this a willful attempt to distract uh, um, the or deceive or obstruct the batter? And in this case, yes, there was a willful attempt to obstruct the batter by short leg field uh, sticking out um, his foot. So now the law tells us that neither batter to be dismissed from this delivery. So the answer to your run to the run out appeal is not out. The bowlers in umpire then additionally need to award five penalty runs to the batting side, and you'll signal this to the scorers, and you'll wait for acknowledgement. You'll inform captain of the fielding side the reason of this action, and when possible, the captain of the batting side. Ball to not count as one for the over. The law also tells us that any runs completed before the offence shall be scored. Together with any penalties, if there was a no ball, that would stand. Additionally, the run in progress to also be scored, and it's irrelevant whether they crossed or not. That run will count. This is the only place in the law where the batters can decide who to face the next delivery. And you report the incident to the governing uh, body. So in terms of uh, total runs, it's seven in total. The batters completed one run. The, the fielder stuck out his foot while they were busy with the second run. So that the run was in progress. And yes, they didn't cross, but the law tell us it's irrelevant whether they cross or not. As long as the second run was attempted, it will also count. And that's why total runs here is five for penalties, one for the completed, and one for the run in progress. Also, good uh, um, technique is just write down the ball, uh, the ball number, the time at the next interval. Just double check whether the scorers uh, inserted the correct amount of runs in the scorebook. Well done, Werner. Next question. Third ball of the sixth over. Day one of a three-day game. Fast bowler bowls a full toss directed at the striker above waist height, which the striker hits to the fine leg boundary for four. Explain your actions. The fast bowler bowling a full toss 
above waist height of the striker standing upright at the popping crease, of which the, the striker actually hit that ball to, to the boundary for four. Okay, I don't see any new hands. Um, just let's just uh, give everyone a few more seconds to visualize this, to think about it. Last few more seconds, I don't see any new hands. Okay, I'm now going to go to the person that raised his hand first. Um, Ahmed, did you raise your hand or is that an old hand? If it is, I see you number one here on, um, in the queue of, that rose uh, their hand. So Ahmed, if you can unmute your mic and provide us with the answer, please. Hi, yeah, because the new hand. Um, <clears throat> it was the first offense, so you yeah. will call and signal no ball and signal for the boundary. So that will be five runs in total. Also, you will um, issue the bowler with the first and final warning. Uh, also inform the, the relevant people, your um, your partner umpire, as well as the captains of uh, the warning. And if it happens again, the bowler will be suspended for the rest of the innings. So because this is a three-day game, there will be a second innings will be allowed to bowl in the second innings, but not in the first innings again, if the offense occurs again. Yeah, well done, Ahmed. Let's go through the answer. Because it was above waist height, st striker standing upright at the pop increase, you'll call and signal no ball. Law, law tell us. That's the reason why it says any delivery above waist height, st striker standing upright at the pop increase is unfair, dangerous, you need to call and signal no ball. So when the ball is dead, you'll indicate to the bowler, this is your first and final warning for bowling uh, a full toss above waist height of the striker. You'll inform the other umpire. You must inform the captain of the fielding side and also the batters and the caution to apply throughout the innings. You'll signal no ball to the scorers and wait for acknowledgement. And you'll also signal boundary four to the scorers. And you'll wait uh, for um, acknowledgement. And then also always in your question, if they do give you uh, the amount of balls that uh, that was bowled, they, they want in your answer for you to put down how many balls are left. So in this, uh, so in this case, if we go back to the question, they say it's the third ball of the, of the sixth over. So now, in part of your answer is because the ball was a no ball, there are four balls left in the over. Question six. During the morning session of a, on the third day of a three-day game, you notice the striker running straight down the middle of the pitch. What action will you take, if any? This is a three-pronged question, so I'll go through the rest as well, and then we can answer uh, them together. So the over after lunch on day three, you then notice the striker running straight down the pitch. Explain your actions now. So in the morning session, you notice the striker running straight down. Then after lunch, you notice striker running straight down the middle of the pits. And then later on, two overs before the drinks break in the middle session, on the second ball of the over, the non-striker, after turning for the third run, runs straight down the middle of the pits. So explain your accents, if any. So just to summarize, in the morning, you see the striker running down. After lunch, you again see the striker running down. And in uh, later on, you see the non-striker 
after turning for the third, running straight down. So how will you manage this on the field of play? Okay, while you, um, let me just go back, just read it. While you two on this, I will, I'm going to see if I see any new ends. I see two old ends, but before I go to them, I want to see if I can see any new ends. I'll give them a few more seconds, and then I'll go to, the, I see there are three old ends, but I'll go to the one that Sands was raised first. I don't see any new ends, so uh, Jaya, your end was the race first. I'm going to give you the opportunity to answer the A portion. Um, Amit, you will have the opportunity to answer the B portion. And Kunal, you're going to have the opportunity to answer the, the C portion. So, so um, Taya, in the morning, yeah. you notice the striker running down the middle of the pits. What actions will you take? If you're going to take any action. Yeah, yeah, uh, Abdullah, uh, again, uh, this is a, th a three day game and this is the third day. So it is a yeah. crucial day in the match. Mm -hmm. So the striker running straight down the middle, I would have issued my first warning to him and uh, I would have informed uh, the batters that this will stay for the full team and the full innings. That would my uh, that would might that would be my action for the uh, uh, yeah, scenario A. Yeah. Uh, yes, Kuna, um, Ajaya, nothing wrong with uh, with your answer. You're applying the law. You're taking into account the 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 state uh, of the game. So there's one of two actions that you can take. You took in, into account the state of the game. You went immediately into action by giving a first and final uh, warning. Maybe another umpire would have taken a different action. Maybe another umpire would have uh, seen that this is the first time that is happening on the day. Maybe another umpire would have had a stern word with a batter saying, batters, you need to stay off the out of the protected area. If I see you, yeah, this is happening again, I'm going into action. So there's two ways of handling this. Your way, you could have immediately go. You took into account the state of the game and you need to be aware this is what what uh, teams do, batters do this. They have spinners. It's the final day of the game. They try to roughen up the 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 protected area to bring the spinners. It is a tactic that happens um, f f at the top level, right down to club cricket. They all do this to roughen up. That's why you need to be vigilant as an umpire. You need to be cognizant of the state of the game um, and, and and watch them closely need to watch uh, um, uh, the batters. So, yeah, if you go that route by issuing a first and final immediately, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong. You're applying the law. You took into account the state of the game. Uh, another umpire might have gone, seeing that this is the first time I see this in the day, I'll have a stern word, but I'll, I'll give you a first and um, I'll have a stern word. Um, but then if I see it happening again, then I'll go into action. So these are the two angles that you could have gone. So you went with the first one. There's no issue with going in that route. Um, for the B for the B portion, thank you for that, uh, Jaya. Uh, Amit, I want you to answer the B portion, and then Kunal, you're going with, to the C portion. So Amit, the B portion. So now Um, Kunal is giving a first and final. That's the one way to look at it. The other way is as the, someone else would have maybe gone have a stern word uh, with the batter. So I want you to cover both scenarios in your in your answer to in B. Okay, so the first... Hey, uh, and just for interesting sake, um, what would you have done in A? Would you have gone immediately into action or would you have gone have a stern word with the batter first? Uh, okay, me personally, I would have gone the stern way because it's the cru a crucial part of the game. It's the yeah. third, third day of a three-day game. Yeah. So covering both aspects, if you've had a stern word, then obviously at B, you will issue out the first and final warning. Yeah. Um, if you've already issued out the first and final warning and it happens for a second time, 
you're going to disallow all the runs that have taken place, uh, return any not out batsmen to the original ends. You will signal no ball or wide if applicable. Uh, you will award five penalty runs to the fielding side. You will uh, inform the captains, the umpires, and the batsmen of what has happened and you would report the interim to the governing body. So that covers both ways. Okay, it covers both ways. Uh, uh, Kunal, uh, sorry, um, Amit has now provided uh, the answer for, for you. I'll give you first option um, next time. So let's let's go to the answer. Yes, the law tell us it's unfair to cause deliberate and avoidable damage to the pitch. Striker needs to get out of the protected area. They need to move away. They should not be in the protected area. So just depending on the route you follow, I could have had a stern word with both batters, informing them that they're causing avoidable damage to the pitch, telling them, if I see this happening again, I will go into action. That is one of the route. The other route is you, uh, to go uh, immediately into action, and then B. If you if you went uh, in a, a stern word, then in B you would have gone first and final warning. If uh, your A was first and final warning, then your B would have been you would have gone into action immediately. So if you went first and final warning um, in B, this warning to apply throughout the innings, umpire to inform each incoming batter. The, uh, this is a team warning. And you need to inform each and incoming batter um, that the team is on a first and final warning for causing avoidable damage to the pit. You'll inform captain of the fielding side and when possible captain of the batting side. And then if it happens again, you disallow all runs to the batting side, return both batters to the original in five penalty runs to the fielding side, award any five penalty runs except uh, protective helmets belonging to the uh, fielding side and again in the last scenario they spoke about balls so there are four balls left in the over so that is all the revision questions uh, for today I am now going to open the floor for uh, Q&A I will start by going to the chat box I'm going to look at the questions in the, the chat box, answer them first. And after answering the questions in the chat box, I will then go um, to any hands that are raised and you can post any question. First question in the chat box is from Jaya. Jaya is asking, keeper collecting the ball from front of the wicket. So how is uh, this uh, treated? So Jaya, if a keeper collects the ball after the ball comes into play and before the ball has touched the batter, uh, the bat or any part of the person of the striker and the keeper takes the ball from in front of the stumps, strikers and umpire to call and signal no ball. Keepers not allowed to touch, to take the ball from in front of the stumps unless it touches the, the bat or person of the striker, or unless the striker is attempting, uh, is attempting a run, or unless the ball is pa uh, past the wicket, then the keeper can collect it. But if he takes it in front of the stumps, strikers in umpire to call and signal no ball. Um, another one from Jaya. Deliberate front foot noble to avoid a batter reaching a sensory. So in the second innings, when the batting team needs only one run to win, as well as the batter needing one run for a sensory, in this case, what do the umpire uh, do? So this happened in a ODI uh, many years ago. I can't remember the bowler, but I know Sewag was the batter. So Sewag needed six to, um, to get to his uh, sensory. The bowler bowled a deliberate front foot. A noble, he was quite far over. Um, and Sewak actually hit the ball for six. So initially everyone thought Sewak got to his uh, sensory. But the law tell us, because a, uh, a, a noble uh, was bowled, the umpire actually called it on field. They, they needed uh, one to win. So as soon as the noble was bowled, the one run that was needed to win the game 
uh, was achieved. And as soon as the result is achieved, the game is then um, uh, at an end. So, so that's why the six in this case did not count. So to answer your question, uh, Zaya, the no ball will count. The, the game will then be at an end. But what happened to this bowler? I can't remember his name. But what happened to the bowler? The bowler was reported for unsportsmanlike behavior because it was a deliberate poor ploy not to give Siwak um, uh, his sensory. So it was, the bowler was um, um, uh, reported for unsportsmanlike um, behavior. I think the bowler was suspended for two two ODIs. Um, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think that was the punishment. Um, bowler was suspended for two ODIs for unsportsmanlike behaviour. But unfortunately, uh, um, if for this game, when then soon as the noble was bowled, um, yeah, the game is then at an end. Uh, the last question that I see in the chat box before I go um, to the hands, uh, Clarence. Clarence asks, is there a difference in signaling penalty runs to the fielding side or the batting side? And how would the scorers know who the penalty penalties apply to? Clarence, yes, there is a difference. So scorers, um, they also, when they get uh, their training, part of the training uh, is that they um, they go through signaling, so they know exactly um, what signals or how to interpret the various signals from the umpires. So, so is there a difference? Yes, there is. How do you signal the difference? So, when it comes to penalty runs to the fielding side, uh, Clarence. So you take your 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 hand and you place it on the opposite side of your shoulder and you keep it there. This is penalty runs to the fielding side. So when the scorers see you touch your opposite shoulder with your hand and you keep it there, that indicates penalty runs to the fielding side. So if you left hand, it doesn't matter. You can use your left hand as well and place it on the opposite side. It doesn't matter as long as, it, as, long as it, you place your palm of your hand on the opposite side of the shoulder. So if the scorer sees uh, this signal, they will know it's penalty runs to the fielding side. How do you signal penalty runs to the batting side? Similarly, you take your hand, you place it on the opposite shoulder, but now instead of placing it here, you will tap the opposite side of your shoulder like this. So how I remember it is I say batting, tapping, and that's how I know. So if I show penalty runs to the batting side, I know I need to tap, batting, tapping. So this is the signal for penalty runs to the batting side. So this, if the scorers see your hand on the opposite side of your shoulder and they see you tapping your shoulder, that indicates to them that you are signaling five penalty runs to the batting side. Let me see if there's any more. I don't see any more questions in the chat box. Let me go and see whose hands are raised. The first hand that I see raised is Werner. Werner, can you unmute your microphone? You can switch on your camera if you want to. And um, you can ask me your question, Werner. Hi, Abdullah. Um, just quickly regarding the exam. Mm. Obviously, we, we are getting tested on law. So I was just asking with regards to the last revision question where we had the batter running or the striker running down the protected area. And you said you would rather have a quiet word in the batter's ear, but obviously the law says we have to give the batter a first and final warning. So in the exam, do we, are we gonna write down how we are working with the batter or do we purely go on law? Uh, yeah, I, I say, um, I said, you know, how practically you you would handle it. So, so in the exam, both answers would actually be be correct, um, just depending on how you would handle it. If you go immediately into action, we cannot fault you. You are applying the law, no problem. If in your answer you do say you're going to have a word with the better, 
that would also be marked as correct because you are, you know, practically uh, and handling it. So both methods uh, will be, or both answers will be accepted in the exam. Thank you. Uh, Jaya, I see your hand is raised as well. Yeah, if you uh, can unmute yourself, you can switch on your camera if you want to. Yeah, uh, Abdullah, yeah, I have a, a two question regarding the uh, keeper collecting the ball. This is, I'm a little bit confused, that is why I'm asking. So mm. uh, just be that there is no scenario of a, uh, a batsman giving out. Uh, the bowler was bowling, the keeper collected the ball in front of the stems. It, his gloves was in front of the stems. In that, there is no out. There was, uh, there was not even a scenario of out. The batsman just leaving the ball, but the keeper collected the ball in front of the stumps. Front of the stumps means his gloves was just uh, uh, in front of the stumps. In that, can I, in that scenario, is that a no ball? Yes, Chaya, it is a no ball. Law tell us that the moment the ball comes into play, and that moment is when the bowler takes his or her first step. That's when it comes into play. Uh, up until either the ball touches uh, the 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 striker or the ball uh, um, touch uh, goes against the bat of the striker or the striker attempts a run or the ball actually goes past the wicket, the keeper's not allowed to to have his or her gloves in front of the stumps. If that is the case, if the keeper's gloves are in front of the stumps, you as the striker in umpire, because you are in the best position to make that call, bowlers in umpire would, would not be able to see, the, see that. So you as the striker in umpire needs to call and signal uh, no ball in that particular instant. And your reason is uh, after the ball came into play and before the ball touched, the striker, or before he touched the bat, uh, the, uh, or uh, the striker at the end, the striker didn't attempt to run, um, the, your gloves was in front of the stumps. That's why I'm calling and signaling no ball. That's your reason. Yeah. Did I answer your first question, Zaya? Yes, yes, that is very clear. That's very clear because okay. uh, some, your, some, yeah. some, uh, some amateur keepers, what they happen you now before the ball, when the ball comes into play, they their keep the, the a small portion of their gloves will be over the uh, uh, stems. It will be in front of the stems. So standing in a striker's position, we will be able to clearly notice that this is happening. Yeah, and 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 uh, um, again, you can apply the law. You can call and signal no ball imme uh, um, immediately. But again, especially at the lower levels, Jaya, I try I to don't. work with with the teams. Yes. I try to work yes. with the yes. keeper. So I will uh, go whisper in the keeper's ear because uh, because they're not aware of the law. So I'll try to work with the keepers and keeper. Uh, I notice that your hands are in front of the stumps as the bowl is running in. Um, you know, the, the law actually wants your hands to be behind the stumps. So, so you know, keep it behind the stumps because if you're going to keep on having it in front of the stumps, I'm going to have to call and signal a no ball. So I'll have a quiet word, whisper in the keeper's ear. And after having a quiet word and the keeper then still do it, uh, then a uh, keeper cannot then look to you. You've had a word with the keeper. You can then call and signal. So I, I try to, but there's nothing in the law that say work with the keeper, whisper in, in his ear. It's nothing but just, you know, part of your, your, That's your a proactive player man. You know, Sorry, it's a proactive way of bearing that. Yeah, it is. I, I prefer the proactive. I prefer, um, um, uh, I don't go onto the field with, with, with a stick. And I'm yeah. and I'm standing with a stick in my hand, and I'm just looking and waiting for someone to make a mistake, and then hit them, you know, fig uh, um, figuratively with the stick. Where I can manage and work with the players, especially they don't know the law. I, I I try to work with them. Yes, there are times where you need to apply the law, and uh, uh, and you need and you apply it. But if you can manage it, can work with the players, and players prefer that man that player management uh, style. They don't like umpires that goes into the game with what a stick and, and just wait for them to make any mistakes. And because especially uh, um, they don't know the law. So I try rather to use the educational method, you know, teaching them um, how the law works and what should be done and not done, then uh, taking out my stick, hit them if they do make a mistake. That is my method of umpiring. Um, I do know lost umpires that goes out with a stick 
and they look and they wait for players to make mistakes and for them to figuratively hit them uh, with, uh, uh, you know, the stick. Um, nothing wrong. They're applying the law, but that's their method. Yeah, uh, I've uh, that is, I've just explained to my method. Did I answer your question, Jaya? Yes, that was a very good, uh, very good one. Uh, Thank you, Abdullah. Okay. Thank you. Abdullah. Thank you so much for your question. Next hand that I see raised is Kunal, and after Kunal, we'll go to Werner. So, Kunal, if you can unmute your microphone and ask your question, please, Kunal. Yeah, hi, Abdullah. Uh, Abdullah, this was regarding uh, penalty to the fielding side, five penalty runs to the fielding side. Uh, for instance, yeah. if it is a one day yeah. tournament and there's just one innings and the batting side is uh, 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 the fielding side has uh, been awarded five penalty runs. So how would it be scored? Because the fielding side is not in batted, uh, so would it be docked from the batting uh, side score? And uh, no, it would be added to the score. So if the if if the pin okay. if if uh, the fielding side if there is a if, if there is an infringement by the 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 fielding side. It will be added to the batting side's total. So sometimes you'll find uh, batting side has not batted yet, but yet the score is uh, five or ten. I've seen those cases. Okay. So when the fielding side comes to bat, automatically the scores will be added up. Uh, it will be. Uh, it will be added to the respective scores of. Uh, if it's a fielding side that m m made the offense and five penalty runs needs to be given, uh, it will be added to the score. Similarly to the bat, uh, if five penalty runs should go to the batting side, similar uh, thing. It gets added to their respective scores. Okay. Okay, happy. Uh, Werner? I saw your hand. Um, if you can unmute your microphone and ask the question, please. Okay, looks like Werner. Um, let's see, Werner is still on. I don't see, I think Werner left. Are there any other questions that anyone needs clarity on? Going once, going twice. Don't see any further hands. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining uh, me this morning. Next week, um, Aksi, I'll get to you now. Uh, thank you so much for raising your hands. I love it when people raise their hands. I look forward when I see hands raised. So I'll get to you now, Aksi. Uh, let me just finish it. Next week, it's a very important uh, lecture. We are covering all the revision questions next week. And there are lots of, uh, there's quite a few of the revision questions. We used the uh, questions of past exam. And there are some of these revision questions that will definitely be, that uh, will be in the exam. I'm not saying which ones, but it's important to attend the revision uh, lecture. Uh, take note of those revision questions. If you can answer those revision questions on your own, you stand a good you, you'll actually pass the exam. So very important lecture next week, our revision lecture. Aksi, if you can unmute your microphone, you can put on your camera if you're not camera shy. Hi, how are you? Good, thanks, Aksi. Uh, how are you? I'm good. I had a question. I've sent a link on the chat box. It's a YouTube link for a tournament yeah. with two weeks ago. Yeah. If you can forward it to the eighth hour, 16 minutes, 20th second. There's a, there's a hit wicket that happens, but uh, uh, I wanted to know from your point of view, the person swung her bat, and then once she finished her shot, then by mistake the bat hit the wicket. So would you give that out? Okay, I haven't I haven't seen I haven't seen the uh, the, the clip. So 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 Axi, you'll be my eyes. 
So you, the question that you need to ask yourself is, <clears throat> with the uh, heat wicket, you need to ask, was the shot completed, yes or no? Did the, did the striker finish playing whatever shot the striker was playing, whether it was a pull shot, a uh, cover drive, a cut shot, doesn't matter. Look at, you need to look at the clip and you need to ask yourself, was the striker done with the clip, it was, sorry, with the shot? Was the shot completed? And the shot was completed and then subsequently the striker put down the, uh, the bales. So if your answer to the question is, yes, the stroke was completed, it would be not out hit wicket. If your answer to the question is, no, the stroke was not completed, that action that the, that the striker made was still part of the shot. If that is your answer, the striker should be given out hit wicket. So now I'm asking you, you saw the clip, was, was the stroke completed? Um, yes according no? to me, yes, the stroke was completed. So if so, so again, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a, it's an opinion. So you looking, you looking at the clip, and your opinion, the stroke was completed, and you've covered now, you've covered yourself with the law because the law say, once the stroke is completed, the the striker can then not give, be given out hit wicket anymore. So in your opinion, because the stroke was completed. Uh, you gave the striker not out. That's why. That's why I'm happy with uh, the call you made of not out because the striker's completed uh, the shot. I see you sharing your screen. Uh, we, I'm I'm happy that we all look at it. Yeah, you can. Yeah, um, I can see your screen. If you can, okay. if you can play the clip. So so while we're looking at the clip, you need to ask yourself okay. the question: Was the shot completed? Yeah or nay? And that will determine. Out it weaker or not? Let's have a look. Did you see that? Uh, it was quick, so just uh, just go back. So before I okay, so before I give my opinion, uh, put in the chat box what uh, what do you think? Uh, Jaya, Jaya saying shot was completed. Uh, is there any other one? Um, um, let me see how many are we still on in the call. Can people just put um, in the chat box uh, whether they think the shot was completed? If they think the stroke was completed, you, you, um, it would be not out. If the stroke was not completed, you would be out. So I just play it again. Completed. Just play it for us again, um, Axi. So look at the shot. Look at look at the shot he's playing. He's playing a a I would say a pull shot. So she's pulling the ball. So she pulled the ball, and so like she pulled the ball, and the pull and the 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 bat came like let's say behind her, and after that. Then she brought the ball, the bat back and knocked off the bales. So let me have a look at the chat box. Let me see what uh, everyone is saying. So Jaya is saying shot was completed. Uh, Doc Nirat saying also shot was completed. Nazim is saying out, and that means shot was not completed. Uh, Amad is saying uh, should be not out because he also felt the shot was completed. Uh, Gabriel also shot completed. Uh, Norbert uh, also saying stroke completed, not out. Okay, okay, Bo. Cynthia also uh, saying not out. Tayo, okay, Tayo is saying out. So Tayo feels that the shot was not completed. That's why Tayo is saying out. So, so now again, this is an opinion. You as the umpire need to make that judgment call and you need to ask yourself the question. Shot completed, yeah or nay? If your answer to that question is yes, you give the bat, um, shot is completed, this batter will be not out. If you still say that is part of the shot, what the batter did, you then give the batter out, uh, eat wicket. So if I can give my opinion, 
I feel the shot was completed. If you look at the pool shot, the bat was already passed. Um, it went behind uh, uh, her back and she then brought it uh, forward. My opinion, looking at this clip, is shot completed. And because shot is completed, um, batter cannot be given out. Hit wicket, so not out. That's my opinion. So, did I answer your question, uh, Yaxi? Yes, you did. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone that uh, participated. Let me go back to uh, see if any hands are right. Um, yes, uh, I see there's a hand right. Uh, uh, Doc, can you unmute your microphone and ask your question, please, Doc? Yes, hi, thanks uh, for this. Um, I must clarify, I'm not a medical doctor. Just, doesn't uh, matter. Yeah, <laughs> doesn't matter. <laughs> doesn't doesn't matter, yeah. doc. You it still doesn't uh, mean you yeah. must be a medical doctor to just, get the, the, you know, to be called the doc. You still a doc. <laughs> you still doctor. Yes, stop the minute. Yeah, uh, I've not been able to attend lectures, uh, so maybe my question might be a little out of place. Yeah, before before you ask your question, uh, before I forget, before I forget, doc, we are our. Our recordings are available on YouTube. So even if you're yes. not able to attend the lectures, you can listen to the recordings. Yes, yes. Um, one of our uh, friends, or, or this is not my original question, uh, uh, in an earlier mm -hmm. discussion, he asked this, not from this group, from a different group. Uh, I should give him credit. That let's say uh, when uh, we're talking about Law 41 again, when, uh, when a team is defending, uh, on the last day, and uh, a, a team is chasing a score, and uh, they are they are about to come to victory. Then the, definitely the fielding side would try to waste time, and uh, uh, yeah, so that they don't achieve victory, try to salvage the game. And there are five penalty runs for time wasting, right? But in the opposite scenario, when a batting side is trying to save a game, save a match or a test match or whatever, uh, and uh, the ba batters are trying to waste time. Then again, there is a fire and penalty. Right? The fire and penalty is meaningless. So, is there any other provision? Maybe you can apply unfair play or obstructing the field, some kind of a law for that. Doc, unfortunately, not. The the the, the penalty for time wasting, whether it's batting or or or, or fielding, there's this five run penalty. So that's, we can only apply what the law tell us, how, the, the punishment that the law tell us to, you know, to, to give out for a particular offense. And unfortunately, that is the punishment. But what can happen, the, the doc, but that's where the umpires needs to play a proactive role because they need to, to uh, be vigilant and, and, you know, intervene and, and, and you need to hurry up. But uh, the, the, what, the the umpires do have at that at their disposal doc is they can report this they write a report at the end of the game it goes to if there is a master referee it goes to the governing body and this is unsportsman's like behavior the governing body then can take appropriate action whatever the uh, um the code of conduct say whether it's monetary whether it's um suspension of games for that particular um and unfair behavior so yeah so unfortunately that's the the only other uh, other punishment that can be dealt uh, out but in terms of the yes. law we need to we need to apply the letter of the law the easy law that covers time wasting by either the fielding or the batting side and we need to apply what the law say Yes, when they are far away from the target, they just want to waste time. And then if the fielding side appeals for obstructing the field, let's say between overs. Um... Unfortunately, not, Doc. It, it's they, their law covers how to deal with batters wasting time. Okay. Uh, and it, it is five penalty runs. Nothing else. The only other thing, as I said, you write a report report these uh, the players and um and the governing body they needs to take appropriate action for the for the unsportsman uh, like behavior 
I, I hear you. I, I, I agree with you, Doc. But there is a law that covers it, and we we obliged to to follow the law. I feel your frustration, but yeah, but we need to follow what the law tells us, Doc. Okay. Um, any anything else, Doc? No. Okay. Thank you so much for your question, Doctor Nirat. Um, uh, Axi, I'm not sure if this, this is a new hand or still an old hand. If it is a new hand, you can unmute your microphone and ask your question, Axi. Yeah, it's a new question. Yeah, I love it when uh, you ask questions. So, Thanks. yes, Axi. So, I wanted you to show us, like, um, you know, when there's five penalty runs, what is the signal? How do you show it to the scorer? And then, uh, you know, the other five runs that come from the overthrow, so you get overthrow, so boundary plus the one run if they crossed, that the signal that you show to the uh, scorers. And then um, when you say that this, you wait till the scorers have acknowledged, what is the gesture of them acknowledging? Is it they hold out a white paper or what? Uh, yes, actually, I'll I'll start with your last question first, uh, with regards to acknowledging. So, Axi, part of your pre-match duties um, to the scorers, uh, part of your pre-match duties is you go to the scorers, introduce yourself, because a score, uh, um, scorers is our IC score. Uh, um, I'm passed in scorers as one team. Uh, uh, also, the gr ground staff. I see us all as one team. We all. Um, uh, stakeholders in, in this game and we work together to make the game of cricket work. Yes, the players are the most important but uh, they think they're the most important but games cannot happen if there's no umpires, cannot happen if there's no scorers nor if there's no ground staff. Yeah, so, but anyway, let's give the players they are the product and they are the most important but uh, I see us as one team. I call it us. Umpires, scorers, ground staff. Always have a good relationship with them. Uh, ground staff is important. I When I get to the ground, I go to them. I speak to them. I'm morning. How are you? Uh, good to see you again. Um, uh, build that good relationship. Build a rapport with the ground staff. Similarly to, with the scorers. Go to the scorers. Introduce yourself. Um, after a while, you get to know the scorers. But if it's new, go introduce. Hi, my name is Abdullah. Um, I'm the umpire for today. What's your name? Uh, how are you? And then part of your duties is you need to ask the scorer, how will you, how will you um, be acknowledging my signals? Then the scorer will then confirm. I'll raise my hand. I'll use a white seat. I'll um, at provincial or international grounds they have lights. And that's the, how they acknowledge uh, the signal. So you need to confirm the acknowledgement of the signal with the scorers. It varies from scorer to scorer. At club level, uh, um, uh, here in, in the Cape Town where I play, the, the scorers acknowledge signals by the waving of the hand. That's nine out of ten scorers. That's how they acknowledge. I've seen the waving of a white piece of paper or a coloring piece of paper. Um, doesn't matter as long as you acknowledge, you uh, confirm with the scorers how they do acknowledge, um, how will they acknowledge the signals. Uh, it's important that you do it because scorers and umpires from 10 till 6 the evening, they communicate the whole day. Uh, yes, it is nonverbal, but they speak to each other all day by the, by the means of these signs. So that's why it's important that you do find out. Um, the um, how they're going to acknowledge your signs. That's why it's important for scorers as well. And scorers do do courses where they go through the various signs. Or what, what are the signs that the umpires make? They need to know if umpire make a certain sign, what that sign means. Similarly to umpires, it's important that you also know which particular signs to make uh, sign to make for a particular uh, event or, or offense. So, um, so yeah, you speak all day with the scorers, non-verbally, uh, but yeah, that's why scorers, that relationship with the scorers is so important. That's your one question. The other question was about penal, uh, penalty runs and the signaling of penalty runs. Uh, actually, there are two types of penalty runs. 
first type is penalty runs to the to the fielding side and they are penalty runs to the batting side so uh, what are the signals for these uh, penalty runs let me start with penalty runs for the fielding side is you take your uh, your hand and you put your palm on the opposite uh, shoulder like this opposite shoulder this is the sign for penalty runs to the fielding side uh, i'm a right-handed so i'm putting my my uh, palm on my left shoulder. If you lift hand, it doesn't matter. You can do it the other way. Um, by placing your palm on your opposite shoulder and keeping it there. You just keep it there. The scorers will look at you. If they see this, they, or they should know, uh, because, I mean, they do study um, the signals as part of uh, when they become a scorer. So scorers knows that when they see this, it means penalty runs to the fielding side. So how do you signal penalty runs to the batting side? You, similarly, you place uh, your hand on the opposite uh, side, but instead of now keeping it there, you now need to move the hand like this. So I call it uh, tapping the opposite shoulder. So how I, 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 I memorize it, batting, tapping. So for the batting side, if it's five penalty runs to the batting side, I need to tap my opposite side of my shoulder, tapping, batting. So if the scorers see your hand on the opposite shoulder and they see their hands tapping or moving like this, that indicates to them that it's penalty runs to the fielding side. Oh, sorry, penalty runs to the batting side. So that is the difference. Fielding side, you just keep your hand here. Batting side, you, you tap. So that is answering that question. And your last question was about um, overthrows, and now especially the five-run overthrow. So how do you signal uh, signal that? So let's just get to this, the scenario. Striker hits the ball into the into the covers. They take a quick single. Cover fielder picks up the ball. Um, the incise at the stumps. At the instant of the throw, the the batters has crossed. So then uh, size at the stumps, misses the stumps. The mid on fielder that was backing up also misses it. It again goes past mid off and it goes over the boundary. So how do you determine how many runs? The law tells us that when it comes to overthrows and if it is a boundary from an overthrow, and in, the, in our case, the ball went over the boundaries. So the four runs will count. The boundary will, uh, will count. Uh, let, me, oh, let me start by saying if there was a no ball, that uh, the noble will um, uh, will always stand and you need to signal it. But let's say in our case, it wasn't a noble, so the boundary will count. So you now need to signal boundary four to the scorers and you need to wait for the scorers to acknowledge um, your boundary four signal. After they acknowledge your boundary four signal, you now need to determine are there any additional runs that needs to be added. So in our case, because the scorers, because the bat, uh, the batters crossed at the instant of the throw, when that ball was released from the fielder's uh, um, hands, that is where you judge. Did the batters cross or not? So let's say in our scenario, they did cross. And because they did cross, um, that extra run now needs to be added. So the boundary uh, four will count. That extra run needs to be added. So in total, it is now five runs that needs to be added. But now, is there a signal for five runs? There's not a signal, um, um, official signal for five runs. So what? So uh, the signal that we that we use for um, to signal five runs to the scorers is we take our open palm, uh, palm with the with the with the palm facing towards you, towards your chest, you keep it below your head and you show this to the scorers. This shows to the scorers five runs. So why is it, uh, why is it open palm um, facing towards you and why is it below your head? Because if you're going to go open palm above your head, how is it going to look? What is this sign open palm above your head facing the scorers? That is, that is the buy sign. So you don't want to show open palm facing the scorers. They'll think it's a buy. So you need to keep your, your hand below or at the head level with your, uh, your palm facing, um, the inside of your palm facing towards you. 
and this is how you indicate five to the scorers. I've seen some umpires do one, two, three, four, five. I've seen them do that, but this you don't have to. This is just indicating five. Um, you, the scorers need to indicate five in the book, four plus the one. Axi, I hope I've answered your questions. If not, you yes. must just let me know. Okay, um, any any other questions, Axi? No, for now I'm good, oh. thanks. Okay. <laughs> any other questions? Let me go to the chat box to see if there are no other questions. And there's no other questions in the chat box. Let me go to the participants. Let me see if, uh, if there are any hands raised. I don't see any other hands raised. Okay, going once, going twice. If there are no more uh, questions, I now officially close today's uh, lecture. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining uh, me this morning. Um, again, next week, very important lecture, our revision um, uh, lecture. So looking forward to seeing everyone 9 o'clock South African time next week. Goodbye, everyone. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, really interesting. See you next week. Okay. Uh, thank you, Juan. Have a good uh, week. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye, Patronisa. Bye, Cynthia.